Good evening and happy Sabbath. Uh, it's a blessing and a privilege for me to speak uh, today, beginning today, throughout the rest of the week. I'll be taking the family life segment and we are going to talk all about family. As the elder who preceded, preceded me earlier on in the panel discussion, he said that the gift of family or marriage is a gift that was given to man before the fall. And it's a blessing that we enjoy until the Lord comes back. What if I told you that a lot of the challenges that we experience in our families are due to faulty foundations? Could it be possible that we are no longer following the blueprint that was given in the Garden of Eden? And because of sin, marriage or families go through a lot of pain that was not originally intended. My name is Rose Misati, and I want to welcome you to this segment. Shall we pray? Father, in the name of Jesus, we want to thank you for this opportunity you have given us to sit at your feet and learn. I pray that you may touch my lips with heavenly call, that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart may be acceptable to you, my Redeemer and my friend. Speak now, for your servants are listening. So, amen. So we go to the very foundation, the plan and the intention that God had for the family. And we will go to the book of Genesis chapter 1. I will read from verse 27 all the way to verse 31. Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, and all the way to verse 21. And we will talk about the basic principles for a healthy marriage. And the Bible says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them. And God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fall of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree which has seed in its fruit, to you it shall be for food, and to every beast of the earth, and to every fall of the air, and to everything that creeps upon the earth. Wherein there is life, I have given every green plant for food, and it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning, they were the sixth day. So God created man and woman in his image, and he blessed them with the gift of marriage for them to enjoy while they are still on earth. Many of us, or rather many people, get into marriage without preparation. And as I said earlier on, that most of the challenges we experience in our families are due to faulty foundations. So what are the bare minimums for somebody to get into a marriage as God intended it to be? And I will draw heavily from the verses that I've just read, verse 27 to 31. People think that you just need to be in love and you get married. Unfortunately, even in our very churches, we have perpetuated that belief system that you are grown, you love each other, you know, get married, we will support you. So we keep supporting more and more people to get into pain instead of helping them understand what was the plan of God when he created male and female and blessed them with the gift of marriage. The first principle is integrity. Integrity. As a grown human being, you need to say what you mean and you need to mean what you say. Your word needs to mean something. Your word should be taken to the bank. Just like the way the saying goes, we should be above reproach, like Caesar's wife. A person with no integrity cannot hold a Christian marriage. 
A person who has no integrity, whose word cannot be trusted, they say this, they mean the other, such a person is not ready to get into a marriage. And perhaps this is good for those who are yet to get married because you have an opportunity to evaluate and choose right. For those of us who are in the marriage, maybe you will know the areas to work on and maybe you will know how to pray and what to pray for. Number two is respect. You need to treat your partner how you want to be treated. You need to value your partner and honor your partner. Adam said, this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. How do you treat your flesh? How do you treat yourself? How do you treat your body? That means the way you treat your partner or your partner to be has to be the way you treat your own body. Meaning, even if you're busy or occupied doing something, you can actually say to your partner, hold on a little bit. There's something that I'm finishing here. We can talk about this later. Unfortunately, people treat other people, church members and other people at work better and with respect than they treat their partners. Very sad. Some people even treat their children with more respect than they treat their partners. Is that the way you would treat your own body? So without respect, can I dare say, somebody is not ready to hold, to sustain, or to even be in a Christian marriage. So the other principles that come about love and submission, they will not hold if there is no integrity and there is no respect. The third principle that I want to share as a bare minimum for anybody to get into a marriage and sustain it is trust. Your actions and your words need to align. I've said this many times that when your words and your action don't align, we leave the words and we take your actions. So in case you're confused, sometimes I have young people telling me, I'm confused. I have this man, I have this girl. She says that she loves me, but the way she talks to me, I say, you're confusing yourself. There's no confusion there. People can pretend to be good, but they cannot pretend to be bad. People can pretend to be good, but they cannot pretend to be bad. So if you're seeing a good side and a bad side, I'm not talking about perfection here, and I'm not talking about somebody weaknesses. I'm talking about vices, intentional, deliberate abuse or mistreatment. So if you're confused because you're saying the person says I love you, but they are hurting you, there's no confusion. You're confusing yourself. The person is the negative side that you see. The bad is who the person is. Or sometimes parents say, my child is so respectful and so obedient at home, but at school, or vice versa. But at school, I'm told they are bullies, they are what? I say it's simple the child is a bully. Well, wherever they are that you see the negative, the bad, is who the person is. So that was the principle of trust. The words and the actions need to align. Somebody needs to be transparent in their communication. They need to be actively working towards protecting the people who are under their charge. The fourth principle that I want to share is Partnership. Partnership. You need to know that marriage requires one to operate as we and not just I in life. You need to be considerate and cooperative knowing that your actions affect another person. You see your partner as a human being, not as a role that they play. You see in social media nowadays, the word narcissist is being thrown all over. And people just need to disagree with you, they call you a narcissist. So that's not what I'm talking about. But I'm actually saying that there are people who are narcissists. Okay, let me say they have narcissistic tendencies. Yeah, because narcissists, then I will be diagnosing them, who have narcissistic tendencies where it's me, I, and myself. I remember one time a lady said that she was married, not she said, but she's actually married, and the person she's married to is an only child, an only child, so, and it was him and the mother. Nothing wrong with that. But as an only child, everything in the house was for him. If the mother comes with something, it's his. If there's yogurt in the fridge, it's his. 
whatever. If there is something, it's just his, you know. So the person did not get to understand or to learn how to share. So they never had a chance to learn the skill of sharing or the, the gift or the value of sharing. So they got married. So they, have, they had children. So they would prepare um, vegetables. Let me give the exact vegetable for a reason. They would make cabbage. So there's cabbage and there's kumawiki or the other bitter vegetables, managu. Now, children, most children, including mine, they would prefer cabbage. I don't know about your children. Your children could be different. But my children, when they were younger, if you give them cabbage and managu, they prefer cabbage. I don't know. I think cabbage is sweet. I think it's not bitter, whatever. So her children were like that. They prefer cabbage. So if they have made this cabbage remaining for one person and they have the other bitter vegetable, so the husband will say, hey, me, I like cabbage. The rest, mujipange, like you have to sort yourself. And the children were young, under five, and she would be shocked because she was raised in a big family. There were six, and they knew if something is prepared, you have to ensure everybody gets a share. And normally, naturally, the younger children will take the favorable thing. Isn't that not so? I mean, naturally, they knew if you have something and it's less, it's the younger child who takes. You know, they knew that. But now, she was shocked. And he would proceed and serve himself the cabbage, eat and finish. And the children cannot eat there. And this is a person, an Adventist of good and regular standing, serving in the church for real. So is Holy Spirit filled, Bible professing, you know, spirit of prophets memorizing and devil chasing and heaven bound. And she would look and she's like, what? And he's not getting the point. The next time again, there's something remaining like one apple. He says, hey, me, I love apples. Me, I'll eat an apple. The rest, you will organize yourself. And she could not believe it. Like she was shocked. But you know, I gave the context. He grew up knowing whatever is there is mine. But you see, such situations are not conducive to a marriage because you have to learn to share. If you didn't have the opportunity to share as a child, you have to learn that in a marriage, in a family, you have to put somebody first. Not always, but most of the time, you have to think about the other person. I've also seen growing up in the village, I observed a trend that I used to see many times where you would see if the family is getting, for example, something like milk, milk, there's no milk, and uh, the family is um, buying milk. So there are many children. Some are even three years, two years. There's a one-year-old. They will get milk for the father and the young baby. Have you seen something like that? Does it make sense to you? It absolutely makes no sense to me. Because the father, his cells have already matured. They have undergone mitosis and meiosis. He is degenerating. There are children under five. There is a woman of childbearing age. This is not about milk, but you can understand. It was milk, but probably you don't take milk. I don't take milk for personal reasons. But I mean, just look at it. This is a food of high nutritional value that is most suitable to children under five and women of reproductive age. But now, the father has to take first, and if little remains, the baby is given. The baby is a year, but the ones two, three years, they can organize themselves, wajipang and a soup, you know, something like that. I mean, and I'm not even blaming the man in this case, but I'm talking about a system that would raise individuals to think about themselves. You have seen in the media sometimes where a father or a mother kills a child because the child has eaten a few pieces of meat or vegetables that were left, they were to be eaten for supper. The child has been killed because the parent wanted to eat, but the child already ate, okay? Okay. So this is about partnership. Male and female, man and woman being partners. And when the children come in, they are a blessing. So they are both partnering to raise these children as stewards. They are raising them to present them when the Lord comes. And he will say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Because in partnership, they have raised a generation, an army for the Lord. 
the fifth bare minimum for marriage from the book of Genesis, I've been able to derive from there, is repair. No, no, no. Number four, I had said was partnership. Number five. Number five is effort. Effort. A person who is ready to, to sustain a Christian marriage, they need to consistently show care and love through action. They need to work against complacency and they need to make their partner feel appreciated even as the years go by. Ellen White puts it so beautifully in the book Patriots and Prophets. She says, no truly saved Christian is indolent. I'm paraphrasing. There is no truly saved Christian who is indolent. We cannot drift to heaven. If a person desires excellence and they are united in marriage with somebody who is mediocre, somebody who does their things in a mediocre way, they will always be struggling because excellence cannot be merged with mediocrity. Excellence desires excellence. So one has to be complacent. They cannot just afford to be passive. It's confusing when a person says they are ready for marriage, they get married, but they are just passive. Many times you will find one partner in a marriage is over-functioning while the other one is under-functioning. They are not putting the effort. They are not putting in the work. They are letting the other person carry the heavy weight that cannot sustain a Christian marriage. When Adam was created in the garden, he was given work to do. And he was to exercise dominion over all the living things that were given. You cannot sit down and exercise dominion. There was work. And the woman was to assist him, support him, be by his side to support him to do the work. When young people come to me and tell me they want to get married, they can confess those who have talked to me. The first question I ask, are you working? I'm not saying that you need to be in employment, but do you have a job? Do you have an income? Are you working? If you tell me, oh, I'm not working, I have a vision, are you vision 3020? Please, no, 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 it can't. You can't just have a vision, I say. So why don't you just get something to do? You have an income, you have a resource, something before we can talk about marriage. So for me, I will not continue with that conversation if you don't have a source of income. I will take that a little bit. I was telling ladies in another church where I'd attended for a prayer breakfast, As they were introducing themselves, I said, I personally do not have a child who is ready to get married or even talk about marriage. I have three children who are past 18 years. But I said, no, I don't have any child who can talk about marriage. You know why? Because they are all depending on me. So we cannot put the cart before the horse. First, you have to take care of yourself before we can talk about you introducing another human being. And anyway, the reason as to why a Christian gets into a relationship is so that they can get married and raise a Christian family. It is not for fun. It's not to get to know each other. It's not because I'm bored. It's because I'm killing, spending, wasting time. No, it is so that they can get married and raise a Christian family. And family needs money. Family needs resources. So can we get the resources first before we talk about something else? The sixth one, the sixth bare minimum is repair. Somebody has to be ready to do repair each and every day. This is one of the most powerful tools any human being is going to need. The tool of repair. That means taking responsibility for on your part when it comes to conflict. You seek mutual understanding, not being right. Because addiction to being right breaks families. Addiction to being right. That you know at the end of it I have to emerge right. You know I have to present my argument. You may win the argument but you will lose your family. So it's not about being right but it's about taking your part when there is a conflict. And protecting the other person. Because they are not your enemy. They are an ally. You are playing on the same team. So you are not always playing to score. I scored. You know I was right. Yesterday. Last month. 
last year, even 10 years ago, we had the same argument and you know I was right. No, you can be addicted to being right, but you end up losing your family. I said earlier on that repair is one of the most powerful tools perhaps we can apply in our families because we will hurt each other. We hurt people. We get hurt every day. But we need to be ready to repair, to forgive, to acknowledge, and to move on to the next stage. The seventh bare minimum that I want to share today is responsibility. Responsibility. Ellen White calls it carrying your share of life's burdens. Because life has burdens and each of us is expected, every adult is expected to carry their share of life's burdens. Not waiting to be rescued. The myth of Cinderella and the knight in shining armor is a fairy tale. It is simply a myth. Adults who are ready to get married and get and raise a Christian family and sustain a Christian marriage, they need to be ready to carry their share of life's burdens. That means those who desire baby girl, baby boy treatment, they need to be feeding from the lap of their mother, not from their partner. Baby girl, baby boy treatment does not apply when it comes to marriage. Every person needs to carry their share of life's burdens. Marriage is for adults, not for children. Yeah? I said, I mentioned to you earlier on, that personally I have no child who is ready to get married because they are all eating yogurt from my fridge and snatching bananas from my rack. So if they don't even know the cost of bananas, then they are getting into a relationship and getting married to someone. They have no idea how much bananas cost. They have no idea how much rent is paid. How will I expect these people to sustain a marriage and even sustain a relationship? It's not practical. It cannot work. It doesn't work. So one needs to be able to carry their share of life's burdens. You know, many times people assume that they can rescue somebody and mentor them. They think so. I usually call it evangelistic marriages. And let me say what I've said many, in many places. Marriage is not a charity project. It's not an evangelistic campaign. Neither is it a mission project. So do not lie to us that you have heard the Macedonian cry and you're going to rescue somebody. We are doing TMI these three weeks. I cannot be in TMI forever. When pastor called me, I said I can only avail one week from today to next week. And it's going to be intense because I have other programs. After this one week, I have to take a break. I'm not going again to get into another TMI. I need to rest. Imagine if you are in a marriage like that, you are in TMI mode the whole year. Will you survive? You will be over-functioning. It cannot work. Somebody has to carry their share of life's burdens. You are nobody's savior, and Christ is your only one. You take your burdens to the foot of the cross. Somebody has to carry their burdens. You have sinned. Say amen. To <laughs> you have seen my brothers in the U.S., some could be watching. You have seen them. They go to the village in Kisi and marry a girl who has just completed Form 4. They take her abroad. She has not stepped in Nairobi. Nothing against my brothers, but I've observed it so many times. She has never stepped in Nairobi. They bring her to Nairobi, get an air ticket. She goes all the way abroad. She, studied a certain, she studies a certain degree that is very marketable. The moment she gets a job, they start saying, Kichongumu. She has become tough-headed. She's now not respecting me, and the marriage is ending. Obviously, the version that you got had not fully developed. It's like you're walking in the jungle, you find an egg, you pick the egg, you assume it's an egg of a chicken. You take it home, you put it with the chicken, you incubate it, a snake comes out. Then you start complaining because the snake wants to bite you. Because simply, the person you got there, you were rescuing them. They had not 
demonstrated, emancipated, expressed the person that they are. So this is the real person and it will not work because you need to get somebody who has already taken responsibility for themselves. Meaning, if you marry somebody from their mother's house, it may work. But usually premium tears loading. Somebody cries because this person never knew even how to take responsibility for many things. Their mother cooked for them, ensured the clothes are washed, the food is cooked. Then you are bringing them and expecting them to take care of a household. They have never run a household. Do you understand how some of the challenges we experience are due to faulty foundations? The person never demonstrated that they can take care of themselves. They remove clothes and they throw them there. Now they will get married and keep on throwing clothes. Then you complain. But that's the person that you got. So it has to be somebody who has demonstrated responsibility that they can take care of themselves. One lady told me in her marriage of 20 years that she has been taking care of the family, paying rent, giving the husband pocket money that he uses to drink. So I said, 20 years. So I said, tell me, how did you get married? She said, when we were in a relationship, he asked me for money to fuel his father's car. He had his father's car. He was going somewhere. Then he said, can you please give me a thousand shillings? I need to fuel my father's car to go somewhere. As a girlfriend, she gave him money to fuel the car. When they were dating in a relationship, courting, then later they got married. Long story short, for 20 years, she had been taking care of the family, the very thing that she planted. And this is what I told her. A healthy man, a healthy man has a natural inclination to protect, provide, and secure. That is a healthy man for you. The natural inclination of a healthy man is to protect, provide, secure. Any man who is deviating from that is a wounded man. They need to go to hospital, not to get married. In fact, it's a disservice to get someone from ICU and you marry them. How fair is that? Let the person go to hospital, get treated. Ladies, women are not rehabilitation centers for badly raised men. Let him go to rehab, get treated. It's unfair to marry a patient, a healthy woman. The natural inclination is to care, to nurture, and to make people and things grow. But a wounded woman will be Delilah, the consumer. She will be consuming. So as a man, you marry a consumer, and you think you can convert them to a builder. That's not true. Patterns will never lie. The consumer will consume Samson to the very end until his hair is shaved. That is Delilah for you. Let me share with you. <laughs> Let me share with you um, what the scripture says. Proverbs chapter 20, 24, verse 3 and 4. This is what the scripture says. Proverbs chapter 24, verse 3 and 4. That's the last uh, reading for today. It says, Through wisdom is a house built, and by understanding it is established. And by knowledge shall the chambers be filled with all precious and pleasant riches. Through wisdom a house is built, and by understanding it is chambers shall be, shall be established. And the knowledge, no sorry, and by understanding it shall be established. And by knowledge shall the chambers be filled with all precious and pleasant riches. Love is a good thing. And it's a place to begin, but that's not the end. A Christian home, a Christian marriage is built by knowledge and by wisdom. You get knowledge by reading, by researching, by listening to the word of God. You get wisdom by reflecting, repair. You have to reflect, you have to repair, and you have to learn from your experience. That is how you get wisdom. It's my prayer today that those who are in marriages and those who are seeking to get into Christian marriages, you're going to seek the bare minimums and you're going to seek wisdom even as you fall in love. You're going to seek wisdom because that is the foundation of a healthy, happy, blessed and fulfilling Christian marriage. May the Lord bless you.
will keep uh, on expounding on that the rest of the week. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for speaking to us. I pray for a special blessing upon your people who have listened to your word today. I ask that if there is anything that I have spoken contrary to your will, may you forgive me. I pray that any word that I've said that is edifying, I pray that we may continue seeking, searching, getting to understand so that we can be blessed to enjoy families, marriages, and unions that are God-ordained. Be with us till the very end of the holy hours of the Sabbath, for it's in Jesus' name we have prayed and believed. Amen. God bless you.